Thank you. I am Diana Clark. I am the Chief of Clinical Operations for O'Connor Professional Group, which for those of you who don't know, is a consulting group organized around serving the needs of individuals struggling and their families surrounding behavioral health issues. So I'm gonna get started with staying sequestered and sane. I am broadcasting today from my house in Vermont. This is not a green screen. This is actually the wall of my living room. And we are what we would consider to be Olympic level sequester people because in the middle of winter, we may not leave for days at a time, but this is definitely different. And the second word of sane is taxing everybody right now. So let's talk about families pre-COVID just for a little bit, a little history. Prior to the last half of the 20th century, parents were insulated by the belief that it was the child's obligation, indeed, to demonstrate their worth to the parent, not the other way around. This was very clear in my family system. It's clear with most of those struggling um, who grew up in my era. And that philosophy protected parents from the kind of guilt and self-doubt and confusion and anguish that greet today's parents. My parents were classic, upper middle class, sat at the dinner table, talked. If we complained too much, there was a real message that complaining wasn't allowed, feelings weren't generally allowed, and if something hurt bad enough, according to my doctor father, it would fall off. So moving forward, we have parenting today. And parenting today means being sensitive to our kids' complaints in ways that would have been unheard of in prior generations. And while this sensitivity increases the potential for closer, more fulfilling relationships, it also increases the chances that parents will be made to feel inadequate, shamed, or guilty in the process. Almost every parent I know who has a child under the age of 30 feels like there is a button panel internally that their kids just know how to push to institute a guilt response. So parents have increased the expectations of themselves in what they will emotionally provide for their kids and what they will do for their children, but in some ways they've reduced the expectations of their children in response. So, recent parent sentiment, this is what I'm getting, you know, I watch all the TV and the memes and look at my internet thread for comments by parents, and I love these two. It's all fun and games, creating children who act just like you until you're isolated in the house with them 24-7. Because there is no answer of, because I said so anymore. When my parents were stuck in the house with us and we wanted to do something and they didn't want us to, the answer was no, just no. Now there's a lot of explanation and navigating of conversation that goes on. And the comic, good news, you don't have coronavirus, but can you still quarantine me from my kids? So we talked just a minute ago about the fact that our expectations of our kids' behavior and expectations of their um, obligations in a household way have reduced for many families. And as those expectations reduced, a lot of over-functioning by the parents began to happen. So if kids stop setting their own alarm clocks, somebody started setting them, and that usually was mom or dad. And as mom or dad did more, the kiddo did less, and that became the new norm. As parents do more, children do less, until basically we have low level of functioning and we get a phone call for help. This is when I first learned about this. This is my son when he was in the third grade and I was called into the teacher's office. And she said to me with a full finger wag, Diana, you do too much. Your son is an organizational mess. He sits in his seat and he expects people to bring things to him. And he often does not speak when spoken to. And I was shamed. I dropped my head, I walked out of the classroom and I vowed never to do that again, knowing full well that I would, but knowing also that I 
teach this. And the fact that I was being called on the carpet about it really meant something to me. So the next day I had my opportunity to test my new resolve. We pulled up to the front of the elementary school and he said from the back seat, I forgot my sneakers and it's gym day. You need to go get them. And I thought, here it is. And I said, well, actually, I put your sneakers next to your backpack. You forgot your sneakers, and you'll have to make it through the day without them. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, you can make it through the day. He said, mom, I have gym. I am clumsy. I am a klutz. I am playing volleyball. I have moon boots on, and I'm going to be bullied, and it's going to be your fault. And I absolutely felt a pain in my gut. Excuse me, I put that too fast. I felt a pain in my gut. I wanted to be able to save, rescue, ease his day, but instead I went home with Miss Kelly's words ringing loudly in my ears, and he made it through the day, and I heard him stomping up the front deck to come to the door, and I raced across the house, and I greeted him there, and I was like, how was your day? And he said, fine, how was yours? And I thought, oh, I had spent the whole day waiting for the bad mommy police to call, waiting for the report from the principal that my son had just been bloodied and bullied in gym class in the third grade. And he had a fine day. And a few months went by, and the moment was forgotten, and this class picture arrived. What I didn't know that day was it was class picture day, and there he sits in the front row with his moon boots on, and the teacher did that on purpose. So how often do you get a photograph of a negative and show, I did not overfunction one day. So I use this in my teaching, and by the way, he hates it. So when we're approaching to help somebody, and this can be our kids, it can be friends. The question is, we should ask ourselves, whose problem is it? How serious are the consequences? If the answer is theirs and the consequences are pretty mild, you go to the next question, which is who grows if I solve the problem? If you solve problems for your loved ones on a repeated basis, you will grow. You will learn lots about how to navigate bureaucratic administrations. You will learn lots to navigate of applications for college. You might learn lots about lots of things, but they won't. Because the more we learn, the more we're doing, the less they are. And what we're depriving them of in that instance is the self-efficacy that comes with learning something for yourself and struggling. So now we're going to talk a little bit about going on right now, post-COVID. Multiple people, including myself, at the beginning of this um, sequestration or sheltering in place, thought this was going to be a great time to do projects. It was going to be an opportunity to reconnect with our loved ones it was going to be having the kids back in the house after having so many busy schedules. And I love this quote by the New York Times author. We went and bought all this paint and cabinet hardware and thought we were going to do the kitchen cabinet project we had wanted to do forever, he said. Two weeks later, he and his wife haven't touched the supplies. They have two children and demanding jobs. And then the Chronicle of Higher Education said, no, you are not failing. Let go of the profoundly daft ideas you have about what you should be doing right now, and instead focus intensely on your physical and psychological security. So, so the other thing I wonder is perhaps it's time to return to a good enough philosophy that many of us grew up with. Good Enough Philosophy was born by a British psychoanalyst named Donald Winnicott shortly after World War II, and he, or during World War II, and he was a prolific writer. And he came up with good enough mothering that mothers shouldn't try to meet every need of their child 
and should allow a child's anger and disillusionment with them so they learn how to accept reality from the rest of the world. By surviving a child's anger and frustration with the necessary delusionments of life, the good enough parents enable them to live on a more realistic basis. So if you are trying to cook dinner or you're trying to do a Zoom call or you're trying to do something and still trying to raise small children in the home or navigate something for somebody else, I would encourage you to allow them their response and still continue with what you need to be doing. Children's mental health. Children are basically very, very resilient. But in times like these or any other times, it's really clear that we should, if we see symptoms for more than two weeks in the following categories, seek professional help. For preschoolers, thumb sucking, bedwetting, clinging to parents, sleep disturbances, fear of the dark, regression in behavior and withdrawal. If you see a whole constellation of all of these that's lasting two or more weeks, then we need to call the pediatrician. With elementary school children, irritability, aggressiveness, clinginess, nightmares, school avoidance, withdrawal, adolescence, sleeping and eating disturbances, agitation, increase in conflicts and rage, physical complaints, delinquent behavior, and poor concentration. Conversely, we can increase the odds that a kid will do well during times like this if we can promote a sense of self-efficacy. And that is the sense of having agency or control over something going on right now. Everybody has control about washing their hands. They can wash their hands. That's the thing they can do to be helpful. Wipe down groceries. Most kids, even young kids, can begin doing that. They can help making face masks, but getting involved in the solution, engaging in daily chores and rituals, writing letters and creating art for older adult friends who are isolated or sick friends, sharing extra supplies from a distance with neighbors. Being part of the solution will keep them from feeling as anxious as they might and try for a few meaningful moments. I remember when my son was very young, he felt like Velcro. He was constantly mommy, mommy, mommy. And all I wanted to do for half of the day was to turn around and run. But I found at the advice of a much wiser friend than me, that if I just turned around and paid deep attention to him for about 90 to 120 seconds, he would become regulated and become more independent again. But creating those experiences takes time. It creates, we, we can do it. We can sing together, dance together, yoga, make deep eye contact, daily rituals and games, all of those things for very brief moments will create meaningful moments because being together is simply not the same as being connected. We need to do some connecting. And there are old fashioned ways, board games, coloring, all of those things, puzzles. When we're talking to people, let's keep explanations age appropriate. Early elementary school children, simple facts with the explanation that adults are working hard to keep them safe. Upper elementary and early middle school children, we need to assist them from separating the reality of rumor and the fantasy. And that can be really difficult and require us to do our own research. Discuss the efforts national, state, and community leaders are doing to prevent the germs from spreading. And with upper, middle, and high school students, issues can be discussed in more depth. We can refer them to the appropriate sources for facts. We can provide honest, accurate, factual information and engage them in decision-making about family plans, scheduling, and chores at home. But the key for everybody is to be able to verbalize their thoughts and feelings. Be a good listener. The other thing that wise friend told me who said 90 to 100 and 20 second contact can shift a day is that we have two jobs as parents one to love them just because they breathe 
And the second is to make sure they can function without us. And some of that comes about by having them help us with the chores. So here's a silly family strategy for all ages. And it comes from this book called Mean Soup. And it is basically, particularly for little kids, but it works. People having a bad day, fill a pot of water, put it on the stove, throw in salt, take a deep breath as it's beginning to heat and scream into the pot. Everybody takes a turn screaming and growling and grunting into the pot and stepping back and letting the soup boil away a bad day. It was my favorite strategy as a young mom. There are also a bunch of virtual family resources that we have uncovered. I am really comfortable going to the virtual resources and not leaving my couch, thereby gaining the COVID-19. The Great Wall of China is fascinating. For younger people, books read by actors are beautiful. Scheduling documents, some of the things that professionals are highly recommending is that everybody get on a schedule. The first thing I do is write a list of things that need to get done and pick two for the morning and two in the afternoon of things I don't do or not necessarily want to get done that day. But there are all kinds of ways to schedule a day, but keeping scheduled is going to be critical during times like this because we have to put on our own oxygen mask. The cumulative negative impact of constant exposure to trauma impacts our sympathetic nervous system neg negatively and causes our flight, fight, and freeze response located in our midbrain to overreact. It causes us to make irrational decisions rather than wise and sensible ones. And we really can't ex completely expect rational behavior in irrationally stressful times. So this William James quote is wonderful. The greatest defense against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. So when we are experiencing flight, fight, or freeze, we need to take action to calm down our stress levels. A couple of hacks we will discuss in a few minutes on how to do that. Connection becomes key. Not a fight, but connecting with somebody can automatically reduce the impact on the sympathetic nervous system. But if you find yourself with anxiety to the extreme, such as that you can't sleep, can't do your job, not letting you do things nor you normally enjoy. And once again, the symptoms are lasting for more than two weeks, get some help. Otherwise, anxiety is a pretty normal emotional response in times like these. It is designed to motivate us to make change or alert us to danger. And in fact, we are living in a dangerous, scary time. The emotion of anxiety isn't necessarily a bad thing. It may be that thing that tells us to put on our face masks, tells us to wear gloves when we go to the grocery store, or pump gas. It may be the very thing that allows us to stay sequestered when we want to scream and leave the house. Some of the creative anxiety hacks I've read Put your anxiety on us, on ice, suck on an ice cube. It changes the temperature in the body. Similarly, when we are under stress, the blood flows from our hands and goes into the core of the body to allow us to have our flight, fight, freeze response. If we can warm up our hands by rubbing them together, we are basically hijacking the brain's response to stress and telling the brain that things are really okay. Warm hands equals a calm brain. Repeat a calming phrase. Clean your drawers out. Jot down feelings. Rearrange your room. Dance in your living room. Do a jigsaw puzzle. Call a friend or family member. Remember, connection Connection is key. We are built for connection. If we are anxious or feeling shame or guilt about something going on in our house, connection with a safe person 
is absolutely the buster of those feelings. Learn the new expertise or simply feel the feeling of anxiety and allow it to pass. Signs and symptoms of anxiety gone awry, sadness, hopelessness. Similarly, physiological symptoms of shortness of breath, rapid heartbeat, insomnia, headaches, stomach issues, and exhaustion, signs of stress, also signs of COVID, which can make the stress and anxiety ramp up. Be, be assured that Anxiety does have physiological symptoms that mimic COVID right now. Psychological symptoms, hypervigilance, anticipation of the worst, tension and catastrophizing. How to support a loved one who is struggling. Understand the differences and how that anxiety manifests. Not everybody has the same response. You might have somebody in your house who manifests anxiety and stress with a fight. They may get irritated and edgy. Somebody else might go hide in their room. Try to match your support to their preferences and attachment style. Some people prefer more practical concrete help while others might prefer more emotional support and just knowing that you are there and they are not alone. Help somebody temper their thinking. In the moment you ask to get back into reality, what's the worst that could happen in that particular situation? What's the best and what's the realistic or likely outcome of your fear? Clinical resources, MGH Psyche, Psychiatry Guide to Mental Health Resources for COVID is an excellent, excellent guide. Boston Child Study Center has some great virtual services, e-home counseling, the O'Connor Professional Group. And we also have some vetted resources on our website page called Vetted Resources. Strategies for living these difficult times. Practice gratitude, even if you don't feel it. Take a journal, write down what you're grateful for right now. It may be simply grateful that you are, have the capacity to write in that journal that day. But the more we move our brains into thinking about what might be positive, the better we will be. Connect with others. Again, we're built for connection. If you can, meditate a few minutes a day. It is helpful. Eat regularly and moderately. Get enough sleep drink moderately, don't let a substance use issue become a substance use addiction or worse during this time. Substance use, keep moderate. Words of wisdom. We must let them, the children, encounter life on their own terms and cannot save them from suffering any more than we can save ourselves from ours. Suffering is the anvil on which character is forged and where they learn empathy and compassion. And similarly, you become resilient when you use obstacles and adversity to clarify what actually matters to you. Thank you. So now I'm going to get ready for the Q&A. Any questions?